All right, thank you for tuning in to Kaiju Masterclass once again. We are just now done with our one hour break and now we have three more panels to go through the rest of the day. Welcome to the panel, uh, Man of Action, the films of June Fukuda. I am Patrick Galvin. I am one of the organizers here at Kaiju Masterclass and joining me on what is the that direction from, from me on the screen is my other um, organizer, Steve Rifle. And also joining us from Kyoto, Japan, is a uh, film historian and author Stuart Galbraith, who I have used, whose books I have used quite often in my own in, uh, in finding out information for my own research, my own writing. Uh, Stuart, thank you very, very much for joining us for this conversation. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Okay, and so like like we mentioned, we're going to talk about the director Jun Fukuda, who made a number of Godzilla films in the 1960s and 1970s, and that's probably what he is primarily known for at least outside the United States. Um, so let's, let's queue up some more visuals here. Awesome. Helps if I do that first. All right, and, and also, first of all, thank you to our friend uh, Ed Gachachewski for some of the stills that we have in uh, this, in this uh, PowerPoint presentation. This is Mr. Fukuda on the set of Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster, the first of five Godzilla films that he directed. Uh, Mr. Fukuda directed, you know, two Godzilla films in the 1960s and three in the 1970s. And he is certainly, next to Ishiro Honda, the most ubiquitous of the sh original Showa Godzilla directors. Although I have noticed over the last uh, couple of years uh, that Mr. Fukuda has been kind of, shall we say, not given nearly as much attention as, say, Ishiro Honda. And I've also noticed in some conversations and some um, think pieces kind of considered to be a lesser director than Ishiro Honda. And now I myself am not in, totally, in total agreement with that, but as it turns out, Mr. Fukuda himself probably might not have uh, disagreed too much with that sentiment. On, these, on this slide here, you'll see two quotes that he gave in the 1990s when he was talking about his work. One was an interview with uh, David Milner in 1994, I believe, and the second interview was with uh, Stuart, who is joining us today. Uh, now, Stuart, you interviewed uh, Mr. Fukuda when you when you were writing, preparing for your book, Monsters Are Attacking Tokyo. And mm. so I was wondering if you could tell us about that first meeting you had with him. And also, if you could tell, like, tell us, like, you know, like what, what he was like as a person, the, the, uh, the, uh, where you met him and when. And also tell us, since, you're, since your book only has like little snippets of interviews that you did, and the interview, of course, was much longer than what we read in the book. Um, was his attitude towards his films really as vicious as he comes across in this, in this quote here? Maybe worse. Uh, yeah, I, what happened was uh, I, I sent out letters to all the people that I wanted to interview, and uh, really 100% of the, the credit for the success that I had, because about nearly 100% of the people that I wrote to agreed to be interviewed, and uh, the, the credit for that really goes to my translator interpreter, Yukari Fuji, who wrote these uh, beautifully written letters. Uh, I wrote a, a, the, the letter requesting the interview in English first, but then she wrote, rewrote it in extremely polite, formal Japanese. And she also had uh, extremely uh, beautiful handwriting and uh, I think that more than anything else impressed the people that I wanted to interview. So in Fukuda's case, what happened was he wrote back and he, sa he said, and this is almost a word for word quote translated into English, I think all my films are terrible, but since you wrote me such a nice letter, uh, sure, if you'd like to interview me, I'd be willing to do that. So I was kind of surprised by his <laughs> attitude toward his own movies. But uh, eventually we met up, we met actually at Toho Studios. We, I did the interview in the commissary with him. And um, he was, um, uh, had a very negative attitude to ev pretty much everything he did. And uh, I think for him, uh, he started out as an assistant director in the late 40s, uh, early to mid to late 50s, uh, working under a number of different directors, uh, particularly Hiroshi Inagaki. And uh, he was working as an assistant director at a time when uh, the, the, so the golden era of Japanese cinema, so to speak, the po early post-war era. 
and uh, when a lot of great movies were being made. And by the time he became a director in 1959, uh, the studio system and the Japanese film industry as a whole was starting to go downhill. And uh, one of the things that occurred to me when we were, when we were all preparing for this uh, masterclass is uh, from the end of World War II until about 19, well, the second half of the 1950s, all of Toho's movies pretty much were uh, original works, so to speak. They were either original screenplays or they were based on uh, novels and short stories and that kind of thing. And so if you were a director, uh, you could pretty much put together uh, a film from scratch, so to speak. But after 1955, Toho began relying more and more on series films like the Godzilla series, but uh, more importantly for the studio, things like the Shacho comedies, the Ekimai comedies, the spy films, the war films, and even films that uh, weren't officially part of a series, they were often uh, sort of uh, very similar films. Uh, Hisaya Morashige, uh, white collar comedy that has, you know, 80% of the same cast as a Shacho film and the same basic kind of story. And those series films really began to dominate Toho's schedule to the point where probably better than two thirds or more of Toho's output, particularly throughout the 1960s, were these series or series type films. So it didn't leave a lot of wiggle room for a director like Fukuda to make anything else. So I think he felt, uh, the, the sense that I got when I interviewed him was that he felt that he was uh, assigned these movies he didn't particularly want to do. And ironically, uh, Toho, I think, greatly valued Fukuda as a director. Uh, they assigned him many of their biggest pictures. I mean, the Godzilla films uh, certainly in the 60s were very important uh, to Toho in terms of uh, foreign revenue. And uh, things like the Young Guy movies were shot on location outside of Japan. So they were more uh, expensive films, films where a lot of things could go wrong. So they had to entrust it to a director they could rely on. So from Toho's perspective, uh, they were rewarding Fukuda because he was a good director, they could count on him. So they gave him uh, the, the top uh, studio product to work on. Uh, it, unfortunately, it was stuff he didn't want to do. Mm -hmm. Yep, and as you, yep, you, and as you, you, you can see from this uh, this uh, this slide here, he did work underneath some very notable people in the 1950s. He worked under Ishiro Honda on Rodan, uh, Inagaki Hiroshi, as mentioned earlier, and also Honda and Akira Kurosawa's mentor, Kazuo Yamamoto, on a film called The Underworld, starring Toshiro Mifune. Mm -hmm. um, so he worked under some very notable people when he was still an assistant director and kind of you know rising through the ranks. And in fact, I think I remember reading um, in one of your books, I think it was the... Uh, the Emperor and the Wolf, that Fukuda was considered, when he was working on The Underworld, he was considered to be kind of like a, a major rising talent, and that a lot of his influence was present in that film. Um, uh, yeah, could very well be. I, I've seen the movie, but not in many years, so I, I can't uh, speak to it specifically, unfortunately. And here we have a quote from a special effects director, Terashi Nakano, who described Mr. Fukuda as a real um, journeyman kind of director, a guy who could do a number, who could do a, a broad variety of things. And do, and do them all pretty well. And, and demonstrating uh, Mr. Fukuda's career leading up to, say, the first Godzilla film he made in 1966, I thought it'd be, it'd be uh, worthwhile to take to just do a brief and cursory look at just a couple of the genres he had done before that. So he becomes a director in 1959. This mm -hmm. is a screen grab from his first film, Dangerous Playing with Fire. It's also known in some places as The Terrible Game. And mm -hmm. it's, a, it's kind, of a, kind of a very um, stylish, uh, rambunctious youth film. And already you can kind of see here the sort of very, very striking visuals that would, I would think would become, you know, kind of noticeable in a lot of Fukuda's later films. I think a lot of Fukuda's films are, are very visually striking. And here we can, and here we can see, you know, he's already got kind of like, you know, and he and his uh, cinematographers already have kind of an eye for that, like this very unique shot here with the, the shadows bisecting the frame and the cars and such. That was his first film. His second film and his first sci-fi film was The Secret of, of the Taligian. 
which I think most uh, genre fans are at least aware of if they have not seen. Mm -hmm. And here is a and here is one of the crime films that he made called uh, Weed of Crime. And here you can see he's cut. He's cut. You can kind of like you know uh, you realize he's already he's kind of like delving into the sort of um, the crime films that like say like you know Seijun Suzuki and uh, uh, what's his name Fukusatsu were also making around the same time. That kind of you know uh, what would you call it? like like Western influenced uh, crime films. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you can definitely. Uh... I mean, one of the arguments that I, I've made in, in my writing about Fukuda is that he really uh, was working at that same level as, uh, I mean, Suzuki and Fukusaku, you mentioned, uh, almost, well, maybe not all of their films, but certainly in Suzuki's case, uh, the overwhelming majority of everything he's done, including some very, very minor early pictures, everything's available on DVD at least, and in many mm -hmm. cases, Blu-ray. And the same is largely true with Fukusaku as well. Uh, but I think Fukuda uh, was really working at that, that same high level uh, in these pictures and really deserves to be better known. Stuart, can I jump in? I'm sorry, Patrick. Yeah. I, I'm curious to ask Stuart uh, maybe a little two-part question. You mentioned earlier that you know he the films that he made were not the type of films that he wanted to make, which is the story of many a uh, uh, studio director at that time, I think. And Honda certainly could say the same thing, but did he express to you in any clear way the, the types of films that he would have been making if he had a more of a, 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 you know, control over that? And then also, why did he, these things kind of, it's interesting the way these films get discovered in the West and then they become sort of, uh, unearthed over time, but why has Fukuda never been part of that same conversation that people like Suzuki are part of? Mm. Uh, well, to answer the second question first, I think uh, part of the reason is that Fukuda was so bounced around. I mean, somebody like Fukusaku or Suzuki pretty much worked within the same genre over and over and over again, making you know dozens and dozens of movies uh, crime films, Yakuza films, etc. And Fukuda was all over the map. I mean, it's interesting because we know him for his science fiction films, but he probably did just about as many uh, comedies as sci-fi films. Uh, we saw a, a poster earlier for uh, Konto 55 film. They were a uh, Manzai team that was very popular in the 19 late 1960s and early 70s and they did they started a number of films about a half dozen or so movies and um, I remember when I asked Fukuda san about those he was like oh god please don't I don't even want to talk about those as embarrassed as he was about Godzilla he was really embarrassed to, to having been involved in those pictures so and I'm sorry, what was your first question? I forgot it already. Uh, what was, uh, so um, no, it was around the, the, the types of films that he wanted to make. You mentioned that. Oh, right, right, right. right. Yeah. Uh, well, he was like almost every director I interviewed of that generation uh, spanning the early 20s, like, Fukuda and Suzuki and into the early 30s, like uh, Fukusaku, he, um, he was greatly influenced uh, by uh, European, particularly French films that he had seen, uh, presumably uh, in the years following the end of World War II, and also to some extent Hollywood films. So whether he wanted to make... Um, <coughs> you know, French type films like Clouseau or, you know, any of the other major early post-war French directors uh, that I, that I'm not sure of, uh, but he definitely didn't want to do Conto 55 comedies. So. Okay. And also uh, in further sampling uh, some of the, of the genres that Fukuda worked in here, we have a slide from the Waka Dai show also known as young guy series, which was a very yeah. popular series of comedies starring uh, Yuzo Kayama. And his, mm -hmm. and, and his, and, uh, his, co his frequent co-star who was in this shot here with him is uh, Yuriko Hoshi, who Godzilla fans know from Mata vs. Godzilla, Ghidra the Three-Headed Monster, uh, Godzilla vs. Megagiras. 
And I, I, I also remember reading in a, one of your interview in a, in a, one of your books, Stuart, that Mr. Fukuda actually thought even less of the Wakadai show films than he did of the Godzilla series. Uh, that could be, I mean, these, if you've never seen any of these films, and again, unfortunately, they're not available, mm -hmm. uh, at least officially available with English subtitles, uh, but they're really charming movies. They're kind of like, um, better versions of the, uh, Frankie Avalon, uh, Annette Funicello beach party movies, except, mm -hmm uh subtler in their comedy and you know less less goofy and uh but Yuzo Kayama uh was actually a really good uh songwriter and uh, uh guitar player heavily influenced by the, the ventures and things like that Steve can tell you more about him musically uh but the movies as i said before uh after the first couple they started going on location and in this case Hawaii but they went to you know uh, New Zealand and all over the place, all over uh, Asia and uh, and in the U.S. And um, so these were these were important movies, but they were also kind of you know formula films. And I think um, you know F Fukuda didn't want to you know make the same kind of movies that were being cranked out again and again. The young guy movies they did. Uh, two or even three a year uh, for about, what, about 10 years. So um, they were really cranking those out. And uh, I think he, for whatever reason, didn't want to be particularly a part of that. Mm. Uh, here's a here's a very entertaining film that he made uh, two years before his first Godzilla film, uh, Tiger Fang. It's a, kind of a, like an international spy film. And also to further demonstrate like the, the, br the broad range of genres he was doing at the time, he went from a spy film and two years later, right and also right before his, uh, first, and also, I'm sorry, no, one year after this and a year before his first Godzilla film, he goes from a spy film to a spy spoof. Here is uh, Iron Finger, also known as 100 Shot, 100 Killed. This film, by the way, is actually available with English subtitles in the uh, American market. If you go mm. to, if you go to uh, the Criterion Collection has an online streaming platform which unfortunately I think is kind of limited in terms of how many countries it's available in. They actually have both this film and its sequel called Golden Eyes available with English subtitles to watch to watch online. And, and also some recognizable faces you have Akira Takara in the middle to his to uh, his to a uh, hit to his left is Mie Hama, also known as uh, Madame Piranha from King Kong Escapes, and to his right is Mr. Taco himself from King Kong vs Godzilla Ichiro Arishima. Mhm. Mm who so, was also a regular in the Wakadai Show series as well? Mm -hmm, absolutely, uh, yep, and also very, also very popular uh, uh, comic actor as well. Um, but so, yeah, so that's just a, a small little sampling of some of the films he had done, you know, prior to his first Godzilla film. And right there, I think you can see that you know, Mr. Fukuda was definitely not a you know one trick pony. He was not a guy who just made you know one kind of film you know continuously. He made he sampled a broad variety of genres. And he was quite good at doing, you know, pretty much all of them. He was good at sci-fi films. He was good at comedies. He was good at, you know, um, edgy uh, spy films, action films, crime films, youth films. He could do a broad variety of things. He was not just, you know, a, uh, a director who was limited to one kind of thing only, even if that's primarily what he's known for in the United States. Mm -hmm. But, of course, that, that I'm sorry, Steve, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, uh, I, I'm glad you're encouraging people to, to seek out these two films. Uh, from the Criterion streaming channel, they are wonderful, and um, the, the the level of humor really, I think, it comes across quite quite, quite well. Uh, it's interesting. Do, just do either of you know where Golden Eyes was shot? It appears to have uh, a fair amount of location shooting, but possibly outside of Japan. Uh, I think. I'm not sure. I think I have, yeah, I think I have that uh, written down somewhere. I'll tell you later. I don't know <laughs> off the top of my head. <laughs> but, I, but I will echo uh, Steve's comments. I think that those films are really a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And particularly, you, you know, around this time, this was around the, I mean, this is 1965. So we're talking around the time of Thunderball and 007 Mania. Mm -hmm. And ba practically every film industry every in every corner of the world was doing both spy films and spy spoofs. And most of those imitation James Bond type movies are terrible and, and unwatchable terrible. today. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but these are these are still a lot of fun. Hmm. And the, the minor point that I was trying to make too is that these films have this international flair to them, and uh, and a lot of uh, Fukuda's work around this time, the stuff that we're familiar with anyway, also has you know some uh, shooting that was done either in the islands around Japan or, or elsewhere. And it's, he has that sort of, that's one of the differentiators you were talking about earlier on about the fact that he's looked at it by fans of the genre as this sort of secondary talent to Honda, but his films really are one of the, they do have this sort of exotic nature to them. And there's, you know, a, a level of interest and complexity there that he's very different than Honda. And I think that's, mm -hmm. if you go into expecting one thing and getting something else, you're kind of cutting off, you know, the fact that, that this person has a, a, a great deal to offer. And I think that's what you're, you know, the whole reason behind this panel. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that kind of brings us to, you know, the main, probably the main focus of this uh, conversation today is his work on the Godzilla series. Now, one of the reasons why I was really keen on having um, Stuart and Steve involved in this is because, as you may know, these two gentlemen did a audio commentary for the original Media Blasters release of Godzilla vs. Megalon. Unfortunately, that commentary track is that that the DVD with that track is no longer you know available. It was only available for a short time, but it's a wonderful commentary track. And what I loved about it was that it really gave you a sense of appreciation for Jun Fukuda, his uh his, the breadth of his career, and also what he had to work with, you know, in towards the end of his you know sci-fi spectrum. But you know, since we are now on the topic of his uh, his five Godzilla films, I think this would be a very good opportunity to talk about you know, the strengths of these films and what he brought to them. And Stuart, you mentioned to me um, when when I interviewed you for Toho Kingdom two years ago, you mentioned to me that you thought that Godzilla versus the Sea Monster in particular was an extremely well directed film, even better made than some of Honda's films. And I was wondering if you could go into more detail as to why you felt that way. Uh, well, you know, when I, uh, years and years ago, when I interviewed, uh, Henry Saperstein, one of the things that he said was that in adapting Godzilla movies for the U.S. market is, uh, he was sort of half complaining, half joking that, uh, every Godzilla picture starts out with a meeting. And, uh, I think that that's <laughs> kind of true of Honda's movies. They, they, you know, putting aside the original 1954 Gojira, which I think is in a completely different class, if you look at the sequels, there's an awful lot of scenes of uh, people sitting around tables and uh, at the UN and in, in laboratories and in conferences. And it's very, it's, it's very Japanese because everything in Japan is done by committee. Uh, but it tends to be fairly static. And one of the things that I love about, about uh, Fukuda's first two Godzilla movies uh, is that they're so dynamic and they're so, um, uh, there's a narrative thrust there that you don't get in most uh, other Godzilla films. Uh, both films, in, in my opinion, have very strong stories that are constantly moving forward to the next thing, the next thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, Fukuda's style is is very dynamic throughout. I mean, even tiny little things. It's a little bit um, stylized and exaggerated. I mean, nothing is is done, uh, you know, subtly and quietly. Every, the expressions. It's all very Japanese st action picture style of direction. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a level of energy there that you just don't get in. Um, you know, most of, of I mean, I'm, even something like King Kong versus Godzilla, as an example, that film is very episodic. We're cutting back and forth between multiple stories. And then when we have this, you know, one story, we have uh, Mie Hama and Kenji Sahara sitting at a table. And then we go to another story and it's a bunch of people on a submarine standing around worrying about what's going on. And then we cut to this and this is happening and people are st sitting around. And I think if you look at even, I think it's interesting because I think Honda seemed to me to sort of uh, almost be a little bit uncomfortable with that type of, of action scene that everybody else was doing. You look at something like um, 
uh, Ghidra, the three-headed monster, when the assassins are trying to flee, and then the one guy catches the boulder and everything else. It's sort of, it's it's a it's a, it's it's done in a slightly off way that suggests that he was that Honda was never really entirely comfortable with that type of action. Mm. Well, he was not comfortable with violence, which is one differentiator between the two, because. Who could have actually uh, directed those types of scenes quite well? And if you think back to even something like the H Man, the car yeah. chase at the end of the film, uh, which is, you know, it's not much of a car chase. They're going through the streets uh, of the city at about 20 miles an hour. <laughs> it just doesn't come off as a, much of a car chase. Uh, so that's one differentiator. These films, like you said, they're propelled forward, even though they, again, like most uh, films in this genre, have a, an ensemble cast rather than a singular protagonist. Both films are, and we're talking about sea, uh, sea Monster, Ebida, and Son of Godzilla, mm. are driven by somebody or a group of people that have, you know, an objective in mind. There's the, the in Yata, the, the kid in the first film, is looking for his, his shipwrecked brother, and the film starts off with these kids actively. They're taking action. They basically steal a boat to go find the brother, uh, and then there's another shipwreck. Uh, it's very exciting, and, and it's from the very get-go you have action. In mm -hmm. Son of Godzilla, it's a group of people trying to conduct this weather experiment, and they get caught in the path of these these big creatures. Um, if I may, there's just one one thing that's I think in interesting and kind of important to point out. Around uh, St Stewart mentioned Henry Saperstein, and around 1964 65, that's when Saperstein became involved with Toho as a co-producer and started bringing over people like Nick Adams and Honda's career started to focus on those co-productions with American uh, production companies because I guess they were looked at as m slightly more big ticket items. There was more mm -hmm. money coming in, but money coming in, uh, you know, up front from overseas. So Honda, Ifukube, the composer, Eiji Tsuburaya, their names were attached to that sequence of films. Well, uh, there's kind of this parallel sequence that Fukuda, well, it's a short one, but Fukuda's uh, uh, working with uh, Subaru's protege, Terry, um, uh, Arikawa, Saramasa Arikawa. There's another composer, uh, Sato, the great mm -hmm. Sato is brought in to compose these films. So for that reason, they look, feel, and sound entirely differently. And you know, again, I think that just out of maybe, I don't know, laziness or whatever it might be, people look at that and they, they see, and they also look at things like the fact that, you know, these films don't have miniature cities in them. So there's not the, the same kind of destruction sequences. Um, they, in, I comment you hear a lot about sea monsters that the suit was reused, uh, you know, and the, again, you don't hear the booming music score, but these, these films are an entirely different take. And if you look at them, they're actually quite ambitious. Son of Godzilla, like in the effects department has all these ambitious effect, effects and different creatures oh, yeah. that were performed with wire works. That's really intricate work. Uh, and um, and the, the you know the miniature uh, jungle sets are really well done. Um, I don't think these films you know are, they've been stereotyped as lesser films, but I don't think they're lesser productions at all. And and even in Sea Monster, uh, there are you know, on the effects side again, there's some really interesting new ideas with the way that some of those mm. scenes were shot. So um, anyway, uh, it's it was fresh blood that was I think after about ten years these films were starting to become, like Stuart said, a little static, uh, a little predictable. And I think it's admirable that the studio, for whatever the reason that they did, uh, brought in someone like Fukuda who could, you know, kind of take a new approach. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and I agree completely. And I would add that it's interesting. If you look at the later Heisei and Millennium films, uh, I don't think you get a strong uh sense of uh each director's style um or in the scores or in the look they kind of all blend together at least in my mind whereas these really really stand out and how much of the the credit for that goes to fukuda i'm not sure because as steve said these were assigned as kind of parallel uh productions that were kind of second banana in terms of importance to the studio. Uh, but at the same time, I think that uh, Arikawa and Sato and Fukuda definitely gave it a completely different look and a really fresh look. So mm -hmm. I, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that they were not distributed theatrically 
Sorry about I think that. The fact that. That's okay. I think the fact that they didn't get theatrical distribution in the United States, uh, also, at least in the West, contributed to that uh, aspect of their reputation. Hmm. And also, I want to point out that, um, you know, while I did, while I, while, you know, somewhat contrary to my earlier point about, like, about Fukuda not making the same film again, 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 Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster does have a lot of similarities with uh, Iron Finger, the first 100 Shot, 100 Killed film. You got terrorists stick, sticked out on yes. an island. You've got a villain played by Akiko Harata. You've got, yes. you got Takarata playing, playing the hero. You got a lot of action, shootouts, chase scenes. So even though they're not the same kind of movie, they, they do have a, a lot of similarities to them. And also, just thinking about Fuka really quickly, um, I agree 100% about him being a much more comfortable action director than Honda, whereas a lot of Honda's action scenes tend to be rather one-sided and anticlimactic. Fukuda's action scenes are very vibrant, very colorfully shot, very imaginatively shot. I, and I've noticed that, you know, looking at his, uh, his genre films and his non-genre films, he and his cinematographers very oftentimes you know, use a... Uh, canted camera angles for action scenes. We see that in Secret of the Telegion, in some of the, uh, the action scenes in Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster. We see that in films like Tiger Fang and uh, the 100 Shot, 100 Killed films. Like just, that, just those nice little subtleties that make him stand out more from say Honda, whose action scenes, as I said, you know, were not always you know, of the highest quality. Um, and there's some handheld work in the, in the mm -hmm. 70s films yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. um, And here are also some nice pictures that uh, Ed was kind enough to share with us. Uh, this is a uh, Mr. Fukuda on the far right of the of the screen directing, you know, Taza Jun Tazaki, Akiko Harada, and the other um, terrorist actors on Godzilla versus the Sea Monster. The red bamboo. Just mm -hmm. quickly, you mentioned the uh, similarities to the uh, Iron Finger type films, and um, like just think of it. There's that sequence early in in this movie where the red bamboo terrorists are chasing. The heroes up the hill, and mm -hmm. Akihiko Hirata is just kind of like firing his gun off into the air, the willy nilly. Mm -hmm. the, it, that couple, that the absurdity of that, coupled with the 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 music, is it tells you that this film isn't taking its itself mm -hmm. completely seriously in a good way. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and it was probably also for the better that these films were very often times written by uh, Sekizawa, who was much much more a much more playful and um, humorous screenwriter than say. Takeshi Kimura, who was much darker and brooding and much more, probably much more suited for the kind of things that Honda liked to make and so on and so forth. Um, here's also a, a screen um, a production photograph from uh, Son of Godzilla, Fukuda working with uh, Bibari Maeda. Um, I read in, um, in Stewart's book, Monsters Are Attacking Tokyo, that Mr. Fukuda had kind of a difficult time working with, uh, with Bibari Maeda for, uh, like she was, um, I can't remember exactly what the quote was, but I, th I think it was, she was kind of, um, Demand. Um, I'm not really sure. I, I'm sorry. I'm totally blanking out what the exact quote was, but he had a difficult time working with her. But he still worked with her uh, the following year on um, Golden Eyes, which we mentioned earlier. And that's something I, something I will also mention as a like, kind of a selling point for checking out Mr. Fukuda's non-genre films. Is there are a lot of familiar faces in them. You know, in the, in those 200 shot, 100 killed films, you got Takarada, Miyahama, Ichiro, uh, Ichiro Akishi, uh, Arishima. Akiko Harada, here's Bibari Maeda, who will appear in the sequel to 100 Shot, 100 Kill. You got Yoshio Tsuchiya, and, you know, and a plethora of other actors. So even just on that, on that small little level of just finding, you know, doing the, that little who's who kind of thing, these, these other films Mr. Fukuda made have, have just, even on that level, a lot going for them, for fans of this genre. Okay. I agree. <laughs> And uh, move, and also just really briefly uh, going through some of the other uh, sci-fi films that Mr. Fukuda made um, towards the end of his career. Here is one of the Konto 55 films. Uh, Stuart talked about this series a little bit earlier. Here is a, a sci-fi take on that on that um, on that series. Um, this is this is a film you really have to see to believe. Frankly, it's a it's a very inch, it's a very strange and peculiar movie. Uh, and by the way, and by the way, Stuart and Steve, if you guys have any comments, you know, feel free to just chime in as I as I go along. But th this is a very this film is is a through some markets becoming more available and more visible in the United States. So it, it's out there if you're curious. It's it's a film you really do have to see it really have to see to believe. Um, uh -huh. Here is a uh, a spy film he made called S Spy, with a, sci a spy film with a little bit, bit of a sci fi twist, and that's a uh, Yuzo Kayama from the Wakadasho series. He is uh, second from the uh, left over there. 
And here is uh, War in Space. And if you have not seen this film, you can probably already tell just from looking at the screen grab, you know, what Toho was trying to emulate here. <laughs> and I, that uh, Monty Python's Life of Brian. <laughs> <laughs> and, one, and one more film. This film I saw only a couple of days ago. And Mr. Fukuda did not direct this film, but he wrote the screenplay for it. This is, this is also a film you kind of have to see to believe. Uh, Horror of the Wolf. He, again, he only wrote the screenplay for this one. Somebody else directed it. But a, fi uh, a film in which, you know, a, uh, a werewolf fights a gang of, fight, fights uh, some bikers and other things. You know, it's uh, a film you really should see, you should see just for the experience of watching it. <laughs> uh, this film, uh, I, I discovered it or only had access to it recently, thanks to you, Patrick. But this is... Uh, a now, it, I don't know if the circumstances of how he came to write the script and whether it was, um, you know, there were story parameters that he had to follow. It's an extremely violent film. I don't think I've, I've never seen a werewolf movie quite like it. Um, and it has to do, there, it's extremely violent. There's rape scenes, you know, the, the werewolf is something of a hero in the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, again, and this is something that, you know, this is territory that Honda would never tread in. Mm -hmm. Another, you know, not even as, as a gun for hire, he would have, you know, never have accepted an assignment like this. So mm -hmm. an interesting, uh, you know, um, distinction between the two. Okay, Stuart, and if you don't have any comments about the last couple of films we talked about, I thought it'd be a, a good point to uh, turn the microphone back over to you and talk about Mr. Fukuda's later career and his later life. Um, so if you have any insights on what he did, you know, um, after he was done with science fiction in Toho, and I would also like you to talk about, you know, what he kind of went through towards the end of his life in terms of like, you know, his, uh, his outlook on his films. And also share a very, a very nice little story you told us on the uh, Megalon commentary about, you know, something you did for him toward the end of his life. Mm. Well, I think, you know, going back to that interview at, at the Toho Commissary all those years ago, uh, you know, it was a really interesting situation because I was <laughs> trying to argue uh, that his movies were good and he was trying to argue that they were, no, no, they're all worthless and uh, kind of a strange position to be in. And um, I think that towards the end of the interview, I think he sort of accepted that at least that I genuinely thought his movies, his best movies were really good films and um, I think that uh, in his later years, particularly because of the interest that was uh, in his work coming from not just the U.S., but from Europe and elsewhere, um, that he kind of realized that yeah, maybe, you know, people are still at least watching these movies, whereas uh, so much... Japanese cinema from the 50s and 60s and 70s is is largely forgotten. People are still looking at his movies and they still like his movies. Mm -hmm. So um, as to what happened later, um, at some point um, in the late 1990s, I needed to call him for something. Maybe it was just to make sure that he received copies of Monsters Are Attacking Tokyo, I don't remember. But when he came to the phone, he sounded absolutely horrible. And he explained through my interpreter, who I also had on the line, that um, he had had uh, open heart surgery, I think, um, a few weeks before and was, was not doing well, was not recovering well. And um, I think at that point, he was also a widower, if I'm not mistaken. So he was basically living alone. I could be mistaken there. I'm not 100% sure. But uh, this being in the 1990s was kind of in the early days of the internet. But I was able to get the word out, look, he's, he's not doing well. This is to the various uh, uh, groups uh, online associated with, with Kaiju Ega. And I said he's not doing well, but if anybody out there wants to send him a, a get well card or a letter or something, I would be happy to pass it on. And I think I ended up getting maybe around 60 or so letters and cards and things. So I forwarded those on to him. And uh, he uh, really, I think, I think he really appreciated it. And, uh, you know, I give 
all the credit to all those people that wrote to him so long ago. But I think that that also made him realize that he he was people cared about him. People cared about his movies. Yeah, and what we see here on the screen is actually uh, my favorite quote from what you shared um, in the uh, Megalon commentary, a quote Mr. Fukuda gave toward the end of his life, where he's talking about how he always hated, you know, thinking and hearing about, you know, Godzilla versus Gaia and Godzilla versus Megalon, but finding out they still were popular amongst kids and also finding out just, you know, how much of an impact, how much of an international impact his work had had, you know, over the, over the years. Even so, while he himself probably did not want to, likely did not want to work on films like the Godzilla series, the fact of the matter is that his films did have a major impact on an international scale. And the fact that, you know, while, while sure, perhaps maybe he's not as admired and uh, um, talked about as, say, Ishiro Honda, he was a director who had a lot of merit, had a lot of things going for him, did some things better than Honda, I think we could all agree, and really did leave a very important, a, a really strong impact on the, on the franchise. Um, out of curiosity, I'm curious what you guys think about this, you know, where, in the terms of the Godzilla directors, where does Mr. Fukuda rank with you? Is he ranked pretty high, about in the middle? Where does he, where does he stand for you guys? Uh, well, I, I hold him in very high regard. I, I love his movies, and I, I, for the reasons we were talking about earlier, the fact that he just didn't follow the, the established playbook, uh, that he was, he, he, it, clearly he was given at least uh, a certain amount of latitude to make the film in a different style, you know, and, and that speaks to the studio's, uh, you know, uh, you know, respect for his abilities. I wanted to point out that you, you were going, you were talking about his, uh, in a way you were talking about his legacy and his impact on this genre. Fukuda was really the first uh, film director in the Godzilla franchise to humanize Godzilla in that he, uh, in Son of Godzilla, made Godzilla apparent, which is kind of like the final or the, the first real uh, uh, transformation in, in that in the monster's you know life cycle or arc from villain to hero and then to basically pop culture icon, uh, something more of a, of a character than just a monster. And then there's a second half that we didn't really get a chance to talk about of Fukuda's Godzilla career, if you will, the films that he the three films that he made in the 1970s, and by that point. The Japanese movie industry had changed significantly. Toho's business structure had changed significantly. And so the films are much cheaper and they look and feel very different in some ways. Uh, and, you know, uh, it probably would be very small comfort to Fukuda knowing how, he's, uh, how he would talk about his films. But those films were extremely influential on an a entire generation or generations of fans of this of this type of film. A lot of people, a lot of people came to Godzilla, not from Godzilla, King of the Monsters or Mothra versus Godzilla, but from films like Godzilla versus Gigan and Godzilla versus Megalon and, and the first Mechagodzilla film. Uh, and on an international scale, as you mentioned, Godzilla versus Megalon, uh, probably, you know, more owing to the marketing campaign that was uh, created by the American distributor, that film was extremely financially successful and had a, for the type of film that it was, it had a very large uh, distribution across the United States for actually for a prolonged period of time. And so he, he makes things like, and, and again, these are matinee films by this point, they're on a shoestring budget. Uh, Eiji Tsubrai had died, the, the studio system was kind of uh, out, uh, I don't know, kind of on its, I don't want to say its last legs, but it was, it was very different and the, the actors, you know, had largely gone to television. So you see different casts. Uh, Godzilla vs. Gigan is a children's film without children in it, which is interesting. Uh, it, it has, uh, you know, in continuing the humanization of Godzilla that he started before, Godzilla actually talks with thought bubbles in that film. In Megalon, you have like this is the weirdest of all these films because it looks like it was made like um, you know almost like improvised in some way, in some ways, and it's um, shot in like these outer outskirts uh, of Tokyo where there's really you know a lot of undeveloped land and it's it's a really I, a lot of these films you you know you wish you could go back in time and hang out on the set I would have really liked to have been there when they shot that one and to see what kind of you know uh, how much of it was really scripted and how much of it was kind of uh, created on the go. Uh, yeah, no, you're right. He's really influential, and probably through, 
not by design, but maybe by default, but that doesn't diminish uh, what he achieved and accomplished. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I uh, talking about the, his 70s Godzilla films, I think that at, when I first saw those movies, I was profoundly disappointed with them, having seen photos of them first in things like Famous Monsters of Filmland and so on, and they just did not live up anywhere close to expectations. And yet, at the same time, um, you know, even a picture as relatively junky as as Godzilla versus Megalon, um, I can watch it. You know, every couple of years, I'll put it on, and, I, and it's a lot of fun. And I, I can't say that about a lot of the Heisei and Millennial Godzilla films, mm -hmm. which I've seen once, and probably a lot of them I'll never <laughs> look at again if I can help it. So um, there's there's something there. I don't know. It's an undefinable quality that a there's a spirit there. I mean, you know, it, it's been uh, criticized or made fun of a million times, but Godzilla flying through the air while lying on its back is something unforgettable, and yeah. that's that's in his film. And, and you know, I have to. I, I don't know how much of we what we talked about him making comedies. Stuart, you met the man, and I don't know what kind of a sense of humor he had, but you have to think that in making those films, you know, there's a little bit of a, a wink of the eye there. Mm. Maybe. Also, the make it the mega. You're right, though. I remember reading about those films and in famous monsters and other things, and seeing, of course, Mecha Godzilla, and then when the film, you finally got a chance to see it, it was. You know, far less than what you'd you'd hope, but again, I I, I put those on again uh, now and again too. I do all all of those really. I, I I find them and and they even the music in the Megalon by um, uh, Manabe is really fascinating and kind of uh, you know one of my favorites. Manabe is a very interest is a very interesting person with a very interesting career himself. Although that's probably like a subject for another day. Um, Stuart, we actually have a question from uh, Kyle Burr, who's one of our co-organizers. Um, mm -hmm. He'd like to know your thoughts on Conto 55, the, the great space adventure, and, and if you have seen it, Horror of the Wolf. Yeah, uh, the Conto 55 film I have seen, uh, it's out on DVD in Japan, and I think I rented it or something. I saw it some way, and um, it's sort of, you know, I'm I'm a fan of a lot of Japanese comedy. And uh, some people know that I'm a fan of a, a, a comedy group that was very popular at Toho in the 1960s called the Crazy Cats. And the Crazy Cats were sort of like uh, the, the Japanese Ritz Brothers or uh, Spike Jones or something. And Conto 55 is sort of the equivalent of the Bowery Boys, is they're like even lower on the, the food chain of sophistication <laughs> and, and uh, extremely broad and also extremely Japanese. I think uh, Manzai humor generally doesn't translate well. Uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't travel abroad well. And then also there's a kind of um, visual slapstick that you see in a lot of the more extreme Japanese comedies of the 60s that also doesn't translate well. It just looks really odd. And so this movie, what, what I remember about it is that it, you know, it, it's pretty appalling. And I, after having seen it years after Mr. Fukuda's death, I kind of thought, okay, now I know why he was so embarrassed by this thing. <laughs> And have you seen uh, Horror of the Wolf by chance? I I looked at some clips, and uh, I would concur with Steve that what, what I saw of it was uh, pretty <laughs> indescribable. <laughs> it's it's disturbing. I mean, I, I I'll I'll admit that I just got uh, access to this film um, recently, and I kind of scan watched it, but I watched a considerable amount. And um, it, it really didn't strike me as having much in common with Fukuda's other, other films. So that's well, why I would lo love to know more about the origin of it and, and his role in writing it. Well, not, not having, I, having only watched a little bit of it, the sense that I got of it is that it was trying to be part of this trend in the early 70s 
of uh, the kind of violent manga uh, adaptation genre of in the in the tradition of things like Lone Wolf and Cub and uh, female convict Scorpion and that kind of, of films. Mm -hmm. And Toho at that time, this is what, 1973, they were really, they had really lost their way. Their, their uh, long running film series like Shacho and Ekimai and all those things had come to an end and uh, the future was very uncertain and other studios were going bankrupt. So they were trying to, you know, they were grasping at straws, trying to grab onto something that was going to be uh, popular. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I thought about bringing this up earlier, but I want to make sure we still, I want to finish the, the, uh, presentation to make sure we still had time for this kind of thing. But, uh, do you, th do you think that, you know, cause you mentioned like, you know, some of the Heisei millennium Godzilla films, which I think we can all agree are definitely, you know, not on the same level as the, the best of the show of films. Um, do you think that directors like, cause I, I remember reading in Akira Kurosawa's autobiography, which he, which he wrote in the, um, the early eight in the uh, late seventies, early eighties, one of those two, he talked about how in his day directors were basically directors in training and they were basically prepared to become like, you know, high quality craftsmen. And in his autobiography, he talks about how the ADs of the early eighties, which as it happens would include people like Takao Kawara, Kensho Yamash Yamashida, uh, Masaki Tezuka, some of the later Godzilla directors, he talks about the ADs of that time are not really prepared to become um, craftsmen. They're not really prepared to become anything but just, you know, career ADs, essentially. Um, do you mm. think that directors like Jun Fukuda um, coming up in that, in that great system where directors were actively prepared to become, you know, professionals and know their craft and know it very well? Well, I think that's, that's, that's it. Basically, it exactly. Uh, when I interviewed Mr. Fukuda at the Toho Commissary, the studio was like a ghost town. And e every time I went to Toho through the years, it was always nothing was going on. Every every stage was empty. Um, there was very little activity. And um, you know, you think of back to when uh, Fukuda was an assistant director during the 1950s and Toho was doing, you know, a hundred feature films every year. And so <clears throat> whether you were an actor or a director or a camera person or whatever, you were bouncing around like a, uh, a ball in a pinball machine from production to production. And <clears throat> you had to learn something from doing so much work uh, so intensely day after day after day. And, um, people who came later who were trying to become filmmakers uh, in the 1990s say um, they there were there wasn't a film industry to support that kind of, of experience so uh, a lot of them are now being culled from the ranks of uh, commercials and and uh, uh, music videos and and uh, Roman porno or whatever, you know, made direct-to-video films and so on. So, and Steve, what are your thoughts on that on that question? Can you repeat the question? Uh, I, was just, I, was, I was just asking if you thought that you know, directors, it was a long one. If directors, if directors like Fukuda really benefited from that that great system where ads were trained to become pro filmmakers, as of opposed course to they like, did. Of course they did. It was a you know a, a full training program. I mean, I remember when uh, Fukuda was interviewed by David Milner. Uh, he was. Uh, I was grateful uh, that the question came up about the AD program because uh, you know, like Kurosawa in the auto, something like an autobiography, Fukuda actually talked a little bit about uh, uh, what hap what would happen. You know, all the, they would be trained in you know all aspects essentially of filmmaking. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that's something that's definitely been lost. Uh, we talked to Kaneko the other night. He was one of really kind of the, the last uh, generation of people that went into the studio, what was left of the studio system in the 70s as assistant directors and, and trainees and, and worked their way up, although he eventually, you know, went independent out of necessity because that's the way uh, the business functions now. But yeah, I think that like so many aspects of Japanese cinema and other, you know, all cinema and, you know, the world we live in. I mean, it's something lost to time. Mm. Well, I think there's also, there's also one thing we can also maybe talk about um, as far as like, you know, maybe the, 
a positive thing Fukuda had on later Godzilla films is that you, you do see his influence, and, and maybe it's also a combination of him and Sekizawa, their influence, on some of the, of the later films. You have a lot of slapstick in, like, say, some of the Heisei Godzilla films. You know, you have characters bungling, falling off of bridges. Uh, you've got, you know, some silly antics in, say, uh, Ryo Kitamura's Godzilla Final Wars. You've got a lot of comedy in some of Masaki Tezuka's films. So, whereas, you know, Ishiro Honda probably was not so comfortable with, like, you know, having, you know, silly things in his films, um, Fukuda, seen, Fukuda and Sekizawa definitely seem to play that up to their strengths. And we do kind of see that a little bit of that in some of the sort of filtering into later generations of, of, uh, of the Godzilla films. So I think even so I think even on that level his films have been pretty influential as far as like influencing later directors in the series. Okay, um, and, and we are getting pretty close to the end. So do either of you have any final comments you want to make about Jun Fukuda or any of his films or anything? I would just say like Honda, I feel the same way about uh, Fukuda and other directors from the the sort of golden era of Japanese cinema, especially commercial cinema. There's so little. Of you know, relatively little of that commercial mainstream cinema that has been uh, exported to the West. Um, Criterion's kind of touched the tip of the iceberg, and there's some other things out there, but there's such a wealth of material that we haven't been able to really access in you know, in a form that that uh, you know, other than you know, off-market kind of stuff. But it'd be wonderful if Criterion or somebody else, Arrow, would would invest in more of that, including Fukuda's work. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I think that uh, uh, what uh, the West sees is is very a very distorted view of Japanese cinema uh, throughout its history, but also the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, because we're seeing not just a tiny, not just the tip of the iceberg, but we're seeing kind of a distorted uh, view of, of what was going on in Japanese cinema. We certainly... Uh, aren't seeing uh, musicals or comedies or even perhaps more commercially viable things like Japanese spy pictures uh, and other other genres and subgenres uh, and filmmakers. As I as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know it's great you can get virtually every single Seijun Suzuki movie, however minor, on DVD or Blu-ray. But there's a lot of uh, major filmmakers, including filmmakers more important than Fukuda, who aren't represented at all in, in mm -hmm. the West. There are no, uh, there's no streaming, there's no Blu-rays, there's no DVDs, et cetera. And um, in Fukuda's case, it's a real shame because he, uh, I think just his uh, crime uh, and spy films alone are really kind of at the same level as uh, Fukusaku and, and Seijun Suzuki and, and other filmmakers who have gotten a lot more uh, acclaim and, and re-examination in the West. So uh, it's deser he's deserving for those films. And then also I think that the, uh, some of the other pictures uh, are like the, the Wakadaisho films. I think those are really fun pictures and they really mm -hmm. offer uh, an interesting uh uh, portrait of sort of an idealized Japanese life in the 1960s that's very interesting to watch and then a lot of the music is really good and mm -hmm. and the films are well directed and they they shot them on very interesting locations so mm -hmm. yeah I, I even though I don't, I don't understand hardly any Japanese whatsoever the Wakadaisho films are a lot are very much very fun to watch including some of the ones that Mr. Fukuda directed um, okay, we are, we are just about to the end of our panel now, so I, I really want to thank Steve and Stuart for joining me for this conversation about this really wonderful, wonderful director. So thank you mm -hmm. to both of you for joining me for this conversation. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Yep, yep. And coming up, yeah, and coming up we, have two, we have two more panels to close the end of the night. We have an interview with uh, another Japan-based writer, Patrick Macius, and we also have an original interview at the end, the, at the end of the session with filmmaker Shinji Higuchi. Stay tuned for that, and thank you for watching. Good night. Yeah.